Man, that was a rough climb getting up here. But it was worth it. Check out that view. But I'm hot, sweaty. I'm going to go for a swim right now. Then I'll be back to talk about some lessons learned on the John Muir Trail, a hike I did last summer. So I'll have some uh, tips that might be helpful to future hikers. So I'll be back in a sec. All right, that was a good swim. I made it all the way home. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna tell you some stuff that will help you with your trip, hopefully. There's a lot of videos out there on the John Muir Trail and other long distance hiking. You know, detailed ones of food, gear, but I haven't really seen one that specifically just talks about things that work, things that didn't work, personal things that I like, uh, that may, may, may or may not be helpful to you, but uh, I did the trip last summer and it was a dry year as this year is going to be very dry, probably drier than last year. So uh, I'll talk about uh, things I learned and hopefully uh, you'll learn something here too. If you're watching this, at least you're trying to be prepared. That's a good thing. Uh, there's a couple movies out right now. Wild, the mile, mile and a half movie came out a few years ago. Everybody and their brother wants to do a long distance hike right now. And I run across some people out there that are a little bit in over their head. They usually make it, but uh, you're taking the first step of watching some videos and educating yourself. I myself am an old man and I've been doing this for 40 years. So I've gotten to know my gear and what works and what doesn't work. So it's 2015, very dry here in California. Uh, very little snowpack. Uh, the JM tiers can probably get out very safely in early June and not even have to worry too much about water crossings. Although last year and last August there was a lot of rain in mid-August that actually caused some streams to come up. But uh, So let's talk about water first. That's going to be the biggest issue. Normally on the JMT, water everywhere. I would only carry one liter of water at any time and just hydrate up at all the streams. Uh, not wise to do that this year. There's uh, going to be streams that normally are running that aren't going to be running this year. So educate yourself on the water. I'm not going to go into great detail about where to get water. Use your maps. Look for st uh, streams. and Know that little symbol on the map that says it's a spring. It's a little curly Q thing. Uh, know your maps. Know where your water supplies are. Know how to read it. So for water this year... Uh, don't count on every stream running when you see that on a map. So when you come to a water source, drink up, fill up. You might want to carry a couple of water bottles. Me personally, I use, this is a Dr. Pepper bottle. They weigh nothing, extremely durable. Uh, I don't use Nalgene body bottles anymore. They weigh too much. And I chose last year on the JMT to use a Sawyer. Uh, it's a squeeze filter and it screws right onto these bottles. Works great. Uh, however, it broke on me last year. Uh, I got a little crack in the uh, where you screw it in and it leaked like crazy. Still sort of worked. It was a pain in the ass. Of course, it broke the day after MTR. So I still had uh, seven days of using a leaky water filter. That sucked. But the reason I use this it is relatively cheap. They're about 20, 25 bucks. Weighs like four ounces, really light. Doesn't use batteries. So I probably will keep using these. I'll just bring an extra. If you have another hiker with you, just make them carry one too. So you just fill up your dirty, dirty water bottle, squeeze this into a fresh water bottle. They come with these bags. Don't bring these, they're useless. They can break. Uh, they make sure this water bottle fits other things. I also use these platypus bags. They weigh nothing also, but this doesn't mate well with these, with these bottles. So make sure I just use this as a storage bottle. So other sources of, of making water. I have a Sawyer. These are great. I use this. I still use this on weekend trips all the time. Uh, it uses batteries. I don't like to be dependent on batteries. Batteries don't like cold weather and they can go dead at the worst time. So Sawyer, if you're, you should be familiar with one of these, I mean a Sterapin. You stir it in for a minute and a half, you got pure water. 
you need cleaner water to do this with. But I love this thing. It's great. It saves a lot of work over the traditional filters, which are the pump filters. Those are great also, but uh, I don't like them. There's too much. They can clog. You got to clean them. So I'm sticking with my, my Sawyer. But be prepared. If they, they can't freeze you. You can't use these below. If it's below 32 degrees, you need to sleep with it in your sleeping bag because it'll crack the ceramic filter inside of it. And you don't know if it's broken. So I would not recommend drinking unfiltered water. People do. That's another whole other debate you can go into. I had a friend that had a got giardiasis, and it he said it was the equivalent of a male going through an abortion. It's basically a stomach abortion. They give you drugs that slough off the linings of your guts, your stomach and your intestines. It sloughs off all everything in there, kills everything, and you're very uncomfortable, obviously, when that is going on. And then you have to drink a bunch of weird chemicals and bacteria to try and rebuild up your, your gut bacteria. So it's not worth the risk to me. So I would not recommend that. However, look on your map, see where the stream's flowing. Uh, look what's upstream from it. If you're over 10,000 feet, it's probably okay. I do drink some water occasionally, but there are areas that look pristine. For example, Guitar Lake, it's at like 11,000 feet, I think. And there's a nice stream flowing into it. I would never drink that water. There's too too many campers nearby, and that's where they have the uh, poop in a bag requirement. We have to pack it out. And where do you think people go that don't follow the rules? They walk up into that basin. So, just I don't recommend it. Uh, you should always have a backup too. And I did have a backup last year. I have these Aquamira, just pills. You drop them in, wait a couple hours, and you have. I think it's four hours. Then you have purified water. It tastes like drink, drinking chlorine. It's terrible. So I, I don't like it, but it's a good backup to have. And we used it on our last day when my filter was too lousy and we were hiking at two in the morning. We, we just filled up some water bottles with Aquamere. And by the time we were heading back down the other side of Whitney, that was, that was good to have. So there's a couple sections of the trail you need to know don't have water, even in good years. The driest sections of trail are from Little Yosemite Valley up to uh, the Cathedral Lakes. And that is a 13 mile stretch. You can fill up at the Merced River at the Little Yosemite Valley Campground. And that's the last reliable water for 13 miles. There is water. Uh, you have to look for it hard. Last year people told us there wasn't water there. So we carried a lot of water and we saw water. There's Sunrise Creek flows through there and there was water in it there was it was seeps but we had so little rain this year I would not rely on that uh, also when you hit the Sunrise High Sierra camp which is in a it's probably about 10 miles in from Little Yosemite Valley uh, you'll meet a trail junction that goes to the left that goes up to the Sunrise Lakes and that goes through the High Sierra camp up there the Sunrise High Sierra camp about 100 yards up that trail on the left there actually is a drinking fountain uh, I've heard they do turn it off sometimes if they do, are limited on water for the camp paying camp guests. They sometimes don't let hikers use it. Last year we went through in late August and it was running and we drank a lot of that water. So Cathedral Lakes is your next reliable water. Other long stretches is out of Devil's Post Pile. Uh, they're between Devil's Post Pile and Purple Lake, which is about a 13 mile stretch. There are two small creeks, Deer Creek and Duck Creek. They're small. They were running last year in late August. Uh, I hear Duck Creek is less reliable than Deer Creek. So Deer Creek's first one, it's in about five miles from Devil's Post Pile. So be sure to drink heavily at Devil's Post Pile and then uh, fill up and drink heavily at uh, Deer Creek in case Duck Creek's not running. Uh, from Duck Creek, you have a couple more miles to get you to Purple Lake. So Purple Lake does have water. So there are other stretches. Look at your maps. Uh, the ob other obvious one is from Guitar Lake to Whitney Portal either on your last day. Uh, I, won't, I won't drink water from the front side of Whitney around the campsite areas anyway. So we usually carry enough from Guitar to get all the way out. And I don't camp on that front side either. It's a zoo after being on the Jungle Trail. Uh, it just seems like camping in a city, but that's just me. So obviously you'd want to carry, I'd say four liters of water coming out of Guitar Lake per person. 
uh, depending on how hot it is too. So there are some seeps here and there, but not reliable. So there is water at trail camp, in a, in a lake at trail camp that's just below the 99 switchbacks. So my next most important thing would be keeping your feet happy on the John Muir Trail. Uh, this comes from years and years of hiking experience. I've tried it all, liners, uh, thick wool socks, two pairs of socks, but what's worked for me, what, what I found out, you need breathability in your shoes. Now in springtime hiking or when it's raining, your feet are gonna get wet. So should you use Gore-Tex? If you're going, gonna be walking through a lot of snow, Yes, Gore-Tex is a good idea, but Gore-Tex causes your feet to sweat. It retains moisture in your foot. Foot gets wet. Wet foot equals blisters. So I would risk having a wet feet a couple days and having a breathable, a breathable shoe and bring just a couple extra pairs of socks. I swear by darn tough socks. These things are quite thin and they dry fast. I don't know what they're made of. They're called darn tough. But any mer merino wool, a wool sock is good, but thinner in a single layer and a breathable, a breathable shoe. So I did, I used these Moab ventilators last year. Uh, a lot of people are wearing tennis shoes these days, distant hikers, but be careful of that because those guys know what they're doing and they're using ultralight stuff. Uh, so I don't recommend people going ultralight unless they really are experienced because even on the John Muir Trail, you can get wet, uh, you can have problems, and if you get hypothermia, you can die out there. And I know it sounds, it, it's possible. So uh, I would recommend heavier footwear. This is a really lightweight boot. My daughter did the trail at Keen Targhees last year, and they were waterproof, so she was able to walk through the streams. I had to be a little more careful. But neither of us got blisters for the whole trip, and we saw so many people at the end with just mutilated feet. So. That can make a hike not very, very fun. So breathable footwear while you're hiking. Whenever you take a break, take a break at a stream, dip your feet in that cold water. Your feet will swell up during the day. Buy, buy a shoe that's obviously a little bigger. And uh, soak your feet in the cold water, dry them off. Uh, I use two pairs of socks that I rotate every day. So you always want clean socks. And I'll bring an extra pair for sleeping in. I'll, have some, I'll bring some cotton socks for sleeping in. Just something comfy for around camp, but feet are probably one of your more important things. Uh, sleep system is many variations on the sleep system. Again, you can go ultra light. Last year, I did something that I've never done before, except when I was 20 years old and we didn't have these fancy blow up air pads. I used a Z light, which is similar to this. This is a thermos, thermo rest, ridge rest. They're really cheap, they cost about 25 bucks, they weigh nothing. They're great for breaks because you can just throw them down and you don't have to worry about them popping. You can just lay on them anytime I strap it to the outside of my pack so it's always available. However, I uh, brought a Z-Rest last year instead of my usual cheap blow-up. Uh, I have an REI, it's like a Thermarest Pro Light, I think it's, it looks just like that. Uh, blow-up pad. I don't use the full length one because I don't like to, I like to keep pretty compact. I just use, I think it's a, uh, it's about this long, it's a 48 inch version, not the full body length. I just throw some clothes in my pack and put my feet on that. Uh, that works great. I decided I was going to try and go lighter and have something to, to lounge around camping by bringing something like this. Biggest mistake of my trip. Uh, one thing I tell noobs is go out and use your gear. You should never be testing any new gear on a long trip like this. So get out and do some trips. Don't make, don't let this be your first trip to try out your gear. I actually did try out my Z-Rest on two single night overnight trips in the Sierra here, and I did fine. So I thought I would be okay. But after about the second night, I, I slept terrible the whole time. I had one good night of sleep when my daughter felt sorry for me, and she let me sleep on her blow-up air mattress. So uh, bring a blow-up air mattress. You do have to be careful with them and not uh, get a hole in them. You can't just lounge around and camp in them because they, they, they get holes really easily. You only can use them in your tent. What I'm going to do next year, I will just cut off a section of my Z-Rest and have like just a seating pad. And I can use that for lounging around camp and stuff too. They're so light. 
And as far as your sleeping system, I use a, I like a standalone tent. I don't believe in stuff sacks. I just jam everything into my sleeping bag. My sleeping bag, I don't have a stuff sack. It goes in first, and then I put my canister, bear canister, and then just wedge clothes. Usually I just wedge my tent and everything around that too. If you have more than one person, you know, you give the rain fly to one person and the tent to another person. Uh, last year I carried the whole thing. This is my, this is actually a three man quarter dome, half dome, or already a quarter dome plus tent. I'm kind of tall, so this is a longer tent. It's kind of heavy, but it's, it's luxurious. We've been stuck in the rain for several days at a time. And it's really nice to have this tent, but I used the stuff sack for this just because this is a compression sack, I can make it smaller. But I usually just jam everything into my into my tent, into my bag, and I use a lot of Ziploc bags to keep uh, keep track of the other stuff. So that works really well for me. Uh, your sleep, where you're going to sleep, uh, picking a camp spot is important. Uh, you, if you camp right next to lakes, uh, it tends to be colder and buggier, things like that. I like to. Like if I'm at a lake, I'll go up on a bench above the lake, or I actually like to sleep high, out of the above the tree line where you can see things. It's usually it's sometimes it can be warmer up high too. The cold tends to sink around the lakes. So one thing, one of the reasons I'm going to do this video, I'm a big environmentalist wacko, and I want to protect the wilderness for my kid and her kids. Uh, I see a lot of a lot of people out there now putting up their tents two feet from a lake. That's illegal. Or in the middle of a meadow. Can't do that. You have to go pick a well-used spot, you know, gravel, decomposed granite. Uh, you can camp right on rocks if you have good pads. Or previously used camp spots. Know the rules and follow the rules. It, uh, I would appreciate that. There's a lot of people out there now, so we want to continue to be able to use this wilderness. And in fact, this year they have new trail trail quotas because of the overcrowding in some areas and the overuse in some areas. They're limiting uh, the permits to go southbound over Donahue Pass. And there's no walk-up permits allowed anymore from Yosemite Valley starting at Happy Isles. You have to have a reservation to start from there if you want to go over Donahue Pass. And they have, I think, 10 walk-ups out of Tuolumne Meadows. And uh, so it's tougher. There's 45 a day to get to go over Donahue Pass. There's ways around that. You can start southbound, but I wouldn't start at Whitney. It's, that's another really tough trip permit to get. Uh, look up Horseshoe Meadows, Cottonwood Pass. That's a viable option to do from the south, easier permit to get. Or a lot of people are starting in Devil's Post while hiking one way, taking a bus back, and then hiking the other section. But that kind of takes away from being in the wilderness the whole time. So anyway, camp spots. Let me tell you about camping on the John Muir Trail. I'm used to going up out in places where we don't see people for a couple days sometimes, but the John Muir Trail is a social experience. You're gonna be with other people sometimes. And we drew the Little Yosemite Valley the first night for our permit last year. And I have had more peaceful nights sleeping in the Yosemite Valley car campgrounds. Uh, it was ridiculous. You're on top of everybody. Uh, there was Peruvian flutes breaking out in the drum in the drum circle that formed at 10:30 at night, and there's there's usually bears around there, but you have to camp there. So if if that's what your permit says, so look around for some some camp spots. Uh, Little Yosemite Valley was really bad. Reds Meadows another one that if you're gonna you're you're gonna go through Reds, uh, there is a campground there. It's, it's crowded and there's partying going on there because people are like, there's beer there. So, which is good. I drink beer there too, but uh, it's pretty loud. And it's actually a ripoff. They charge you 20 bucks for the camp spot and you're gonna share it with like 20 other people. If you just go to the car campgrounds a little up the road, you can rent one of those spots without a car and have your own private camp spot or the Reds Meadow has cabins. They're 85 bucks. It's money well spent. You can even split it with, you can, you'll meet tons and tons of people out there. You can split the room with somebody else if they have them available. We hiked with some guys last year who didn't have a reservation and 
they were jealous that we were staying in one of the cabins and they, they got the last cabin for that night. And this was, again, late. we went late August, we finished September 7th. And that's a little less crowded part of the season, but it, it was a zoo to me. There was a lot, a lot of people. So uh, we had to go look a little harder to get camp spots without sharing it with a lot of people. Other campgrounds that I didn't like were Lower Vedette. It's a bug infested, bear infested area. Uh, it's pretty, but it's, I would go keep going past Vedette and try to get at least upper Vedette. But if you can go a little higher, right about tree line, there's a little stream up there. And there was an old, the, the John Muir Trail used to go through what's called Center Basin. And there is uh, some good camping up there. And that water should still be flowing. It's, it's at a pretty high, high elevation. So uh, Purple Lake was another one of my not favorite places because we were just jammed on top of a bunch of people. It, it again, in early season, can be a very buggy place. So the problem is it's thir so about 13 miles in from Red, so it's hard to get that far. Yeah, so if you want to avoid crowds, skip Reds altogether and go camp at like Crater Meadow uh, or if you can make it to Deer Creek. And then uh, that next day will set you up to, you can get to Virginia Lake, which is about 14 miles in from Reds. And Virginia Lake's beautiful. I wish we had been able to camp there, but we passed a lot of places that I would have loved to camp, but uh, we didn't have, it was just didn't set up right. So Virginia's a really good place. I'm gonna tell you some other campgrounds that I really like. Uh, Lyle Canyon's a zoo, so it's flat. So you, it's an easy nine miles up to the head of Lyle Canyon. Keep going up towards the pass. There's some camp spots up higher at some tarns there. There's a bridge that goes over the creek. That can be a really, really nice area. There's water there. Uh, it's a little overrun. I think that's one of the areas that was impacted that forced the Forest Service to put up a, a, a quota on Donahue Pass this year. So that's a good spot. Uh, I loved, I love Garnet Lake. Uh, you're going to see Thousand Island Lake if you're hiking southbound. It's beautiful. One of the most picturesque places on the John Muir Trail. Uh, but it's overrun with people because it's, it's a six-mile hike in from uh, Devil's Post Box. So it can be super, super proud. Go to Garnet. Garnet's a little three miles past there. And you, if you hike to the backside of the lake, it's not so bad over there. And it's gorgeous. The sun sets over Banner and Ritter. Spectacular. So that, that, that's a really good area. Uh, McClure and Evolution areas were awesome. I love McClure Meadow. When you first come into McClure, if you can grab a spot there. It was crowded, but the sunsets over the meadow, worth it. It was, it was really cool. Uh, another place we didn't camp that I wish we had, we stopped at the Bench Lake Junction one, one day. We were tired. We didn't know if we'd gone like a mile and a half farther, we would hit Marjorie. Marjorie's beautiful. Sets you up really good the next day for... Pinch up pass. So uh, that was a good one. I always wanted to camp at big, on the Bighorn Plateau, but uh, we didn't have time this year. That's that's a really spectacular, kind of barren, strange area, but it's beautiful. I, I couldn't imagine the, the stars at night there. That would be a good place to go. I love Palisade, uh, Pal Lower Palisade Lake, uh, but don't camp near the outlet. It's, there's, it's bushy and if there's gonna be mosquitoes, they're gonna be there. Camp up, up on the on the benches past that area. There's some spectacular campsites up there that I uh, really liked. Uh, Guitar, it's a love it or hate it place. I love it. It's beautiful. It's kind of a party. Everybody's usually on their last day of their, their trip, and everybody gets together and peels off whatever booze and food they got left over. And uh, I like to get up at like 2 in the morning and hike up to Whitney and out from there. So... Uh, it is a pretty spot, but if you if you don't like the crowds, you can go up to the Tarn right above that. It's about a half mile above the Tarn. That's that's a good place to camp also because there's still water up there, and that way you avoid avoid the crowds a little bit. So, uh, speaking of camping, I like to camp up high. Obviously, being high in the Sierra causes altitude sickness with some people. I'm lucky where I don't usually get that. I don't think I've ever had it, but. Getting used to the altitude helps. If you do start from Happy Isles, you're going to slowly work your way up to altitude. So it shouldn't be as much of an issue. Uh, however, this year a lot of people are going to be starting from Tuolumne Meadows or other locations and they might get into high altitude quicker. Uh, the most important thing 
is sleep your first night at altitude if possible. Uh, one of the places, the places I can think of if you're, if you're around Whitney, uh, Horseshoe Meadows has a campground that you can, it's just got a one night limit. It's at 10,000 feet. Onion Valley, uh, Tioga Pass, Tuolumne Meadows, those are all around 10,000 feet. And uh, Mammoth Mountain Inn is at 9,000, I believe. Those are all good places to camp one night if you, if you can to help either getting used to the altitude. Uh, also, bring make sure you bring some uh, some aspirin for the headaches you're, you're bound to get. We didn't get any last year, but it is possible. Uh, drink lots, lots, and lots of fluid, even when you're not thirsty. That'll also help with your altitude sickness. But uh, if you make it from Happy Isles to Reds, you're home free. You're, you're probably going to be fine. And by the time you get to the end of the trail, the funnest part is blowing away all the day hikers because you're going to be in such good shape and so used to the altitude. So if you have a car, you can find those camp spots. A lot of you are going to be coming in at buses and trains and all that stuff. So I'm not going to go into details of the transportation system. It's kind of sporadic, but the yards, you send me area rapid transit is really, really good and reliable, nice buses. On the east side of the Sierra, there's what's called ESTA, E-S-T-A. Look up their websites and look up their schedules. Uh, those work really well for, for getting around. If you do have a car, take advantage of the resupplies. Uh, there's no use carrying a bunch of crap if you don't need to. Uh, what you can do when you're, if you're, say you're going north to south, you drop your car off at the end of the line. We leave ours at the Dow Villa, by the way. They're in Lone Pine, this place called the Dow Villa. They have free parking. You can leave your car in a, par a lit parking lot right in Lone Pine for weeks, and it's, it's safe there. And then you just thumb a ride down from the top of Whitney. It's the easiest hitchhike in the Sierra. I've done it three times, and I've never waited for more than three cars to go by. So don't worry about leaving your car up there. That way you don't have to clean it out, worry about bears breaking into or anything. Lone Pine, good place to stay, pretty cheap. There's also a hostel there, too. That you can stay in at Lone Pine. Then you can catch the 6.30 a.m. bus, which hooks up the yards and get all the way back to Yosemite Valley to start, or to all the meadows if that's your, your starting point. But if you do have a car, we drove up and we left a resupply in the wilderness parking lot in Tuolumne Meadows. I sent one to Reds. We didn't use VVR for Million Valley Resort. It's going to be unreliable this year because the lake's so low, they're going to have trouble running their shuttle. I've heard rumors that they're going to be doing a resupply, they're going to have it at the other end of the lake, so you will be able to use it for that. So check that out. Uh, MTR will be reliable. And uh, MTR, when we were there in September of last year, there was so much food there, you didn't even need to re use a resupply. But that was late in the season. So there was lots and lots of food there. Uh, so things, there was overflowing with oatmeal. So apparently people got sick of oatmeal. So. Let me go over some food real quick. Things that I like, things that work for me. There's tons and tons of options, but on that second leg from MTR all the way out, unless you stop at and you hike out over Onion Valley, over Crisarge Pass, the Williamson Hotel, by the way, I'll throw that name out there. They have a, a service there. If you stay there, they'll drive you back up the trailhead and pick you up. And uh, you can go, go into the town of Independence and get some food and hike. But that's two, two extra days of hiking. Some of you still have jobs like me, and I didn't have time to do that. So we just carried everything out from MTR all the way out. So that section is a little more challenging with food because uh, it's hard to carry enough food that is fatty enough to keep you from uh, getting hungry on the, on the last section. So you want to bring food you like. Uh, I, live, I can live on Snickers bars. We eat two a day, and one for breakfast and one for dessert. And the, you like them. I bring power bars, cliff bars. It's like eating dirt after a while. I get tired of eating those things. So uh, we like those. If you can fit it, I like to bring treats. Something like, I love these Nutter Butters. We brought these last year. Cheese is awesome. Salami, stuff like that. Of course, it's great, but you can't bring that stuff on the second leg of the trip because it won't last that long. It won't keep that long. So you have to be a little more creative on the second half. But in the first half, if you do take advantage of those resupplies, Tuolumne Meadows, is, you, you can uh, just mail stuff there. You can eat there. By the way, the burgers are awful there, but eat one anyway because you'll need – Oh, they, they have some chicken things too, and they also have beer. So you can stuff your face there a little bit. Red's Meadow Burger was spectacular, so they have milkshakes there too. So 
take advantage of this place. The MTR, I would raid the raider buck, uh, the hiker buckets, even if you have a resupply there, stuff your face, maybe even camp nearby and like dinner and breakfast, just go pick out food that people leave there. There's lots and lots of food there because it's a long haul out. So on the second half of the trip, I did some things that I don't usually do. Uh, we brought refried beans, which were awesome. Uh, you could just bring some tortillas. They're super light. They're relatively cheap. Uh, Freeze-dried refried, refried beans. And what we did, I have this little cup, and uh, we would just, at a morning break, I would just throw a little water. you got to rehydrate. I'd throw a little water in here. Cold. You don't have to heat them up. Put this back on, strap it to your pack, and by the time you get to lunch, you have some rehydrated beans. And you can add some cheese or some some uh, salami or jerky or whatever else you have around. Make, be creative with that stuff. So that was good. We decided not to cook for breakfast so we could get up early and hit the trail really fast. So I'm tired of oatmeal. I don't, don't want to do oatmeal very often anymore. So we used uh, these breakfast essentials. There's a couple hundred calories. They have some pretty good nutrients in them. And we used good old Nido. This stuff is whole fat milk. I don't drink this at home, but you will need fat on the trail. Uh, I lost around 20 pounds on the trail last year. So I would recommend being in shape. I was fit. I did work out. But keep a few pounds on your body. You don't want to be skinny. You just want to be fit because that, that's going to come off. Your body's going to feed up the fat up your body. I ran out of fat and then started eating muscle on me. So I was pretty scrawny. I looked like I just got out of a prison camp when I got to the end, but it came back on, unfortunately. So Nido was a good thing. So these milkshakes, we would just cook them up for breakfast or put them in a, the powder in a bottle, shake them up, hit the trail. We ate stuff like granola, uh, munched on the trail, and we took breaks for breakfast. Then at lunch, we mostly did tor tortillas. Uh, other foods that worked really well. Well, by the way, in the second half, Finding a container for your olive oil. You want something like olive oil, ghee, something fatty. Uh, we used a little mini water bottle and filled that with olive oil. And then you dump that in your noodles or your mountain house meals, whatever. And it gives you a little extra fat. Trust me, you'll need it. You put it in as much as you can. Now, in the early parts of the trail where you're getting a lot of resupplies, uh, our second night out, I used a whole cube of butter in a macaroni and cheese, just a regular craft macaroni and cheese. I mean, it's extremely fatty and un unhealthy, but it was awesome. So keep your spirits up the first part. This first, uh, I think our second day lunch, we had real sandwiches. We brought bread. We stole some condiments from Chick-fil-A of mayonnaise. We had real meat, real cheese, and that was that was spectacular. Keep your spirits up. You gotta keep your morale up. So. That worked well for us, you know, lots of, you can have like, that's when you have your cookies and things like that. So, cause you're gonna not be able to do as much of that, that stuff at the end of the trail. So yeah, Mountain House, Mary Jane's, whatever. Packet Gourmet has a lot of cool stuff. Uh, what we like to do is take like these Noors, these Noors foods. There's a whole bunch of them. This is an Alfredo, which is fatty. And uh, I think we liked, uh, there was a chicken and broccoli one or some rice ones. They were awesome. So you supplement these. You can throw stuff in them. Be creative out there. Uh, Packet Gourmet has freeze-dried cheese, which sounds horrible, but it's actually pretty good. Uh, and we got some freeze-dried chicken, and we had freeze-dried hamburger. So you, we had pastas. You throw in some hamburger. You, had, oh, that would, you could do that for your when you're rehydrating your beans. Throw some hamburger. Uh, hamburger in there. You can make that yourself at home too. You can look that up, how to make freeze-dried hamburger. You throw that in with your beans, throw it in here, and at lunchtime it's good to go. So uh, no backpacker should ever go out in the woods without Idaho and mashed potatoes. These things are good anywhere. They're super easy to cook anytime. And I actually, if I was going solo, I would just eat everything out of my pot. But uh, I I usually don't go solo, but sometimes I do. And I use, geez, I haven't washed this since the last time I went backpacking. I like these little containers. This is made by uh, Sea to Summit. And uh, it's got a little lid. The reason I like that, you can use it as a plate and a bowl. It's perfect for one, I think it's one cup of water. You put your potatoes, one cup of water. 
you got your lid to keep it hot while you're, if you're cooking other things. And then when you're done, you just fill this up with water, shake it around, and dump it out, and you're good to go. So that's kind of a handy little thing. So yeah, that's pretty much it for food. Again, uh, I can't say this, stress this enough. If you're doing this, and this is one of your first multi-day hikes, you're gonna make mistakes. Get out and use your gear. Know your gear. The John Muir Trail is not the place to try out new gear. So uh, do some practice hikes first. It will save you a lot of heartache. And speaking of heartache, there's nothing like being out on the trail when it's 20 degrees and trying to get one of these things open, these bear vaults. They can be really tough to open when it's cold. So this is a neat little trick that really helps. I always bring up just a half of a credit card. Weighs nothing. Sometimes it's really hard to get a grip on here and get your hands in there and get this thing open when you're hungry. So what you do, you slide this card in between the two notches and then you just spin it. Yeah, that doesn't work. I need two hands. He started to do this with one hand. Anyway, you put that through the notches, spin it, and it opens right up, usually. <laughs> As you can see, I it's hard to do, even, so you put that right in the slot and turn it and it, it goes right past the notch and opens up. So just in case your hands don't, aren't working right on a cold morning. So that comes in handy. Oh, I forgot to tell you, I sleep with a, uh, this is a little pillow, it doesn't matter which brand, this is an X-Bed, uh, REI sells them. It's just a little blow up thing. You can even blow up a Ziploc bag because when you're on a pad, you know it's not sinking into it like a bed, so your neck's gonna be like this when you sleep. So I like, I take this pillow and wrap it up in a, my fleece jacket, and it gives me a really nice pillow. So sleeping is important. Uh, maybe a little jack helps you too, so, but it's hard to carry that. So uh, that's it for food. Uh, clothes, I'm not gonna go into great detail on clothes, but polypropylene is your friend. Don't bring cotton. Don't get wet. Again, like I mentioned before, you catch hypothermia out there. Underwear are pretty important. I know you want to talk about underwear. These are, these things cost a lot. These are like 20 bucks. This is an REI brand, thin polypropylene. Well, it's 92% polyester, 8% spandex. I won't be caught dead in spandex at home, but on the trail, uh, polypropylene shirts, underwear, Again, it's like your feet. You got to keep dry. You don't want to get uh, what we call crotch rot or swamp ass. There's a lot of names for it. If you've had it, it's extremely uncomfortable. It stings. Your sweat gets in there. So a couple pairs of underwear. Change off every day. They don't wear them. I actually bring three pairs. I bring a sleeping pair and two, two of these for the trail. So brand doesn't matter, but they need to be polypropylene. Do not wear cotton underwear. You'll be miserable. Uh, as far as clothing, uh, a lot of people wear like safari hats and cover up everything in long sleeves, long pants. Uh, and that's probably smart. Uh, I work outside and uh, so I'm usually have a pretty good farmer stand going. So I just use sunscreen and because it was, it was hot last year when we were on the trail. My daughter lives a mile from the beach so she comes with me on most of my trips and she has a good tan also. So. Sunscreen on the nose, tops of the ears, on your face, tops of your hands. My daughter's tops of her hands got pretty severely sunburned a couple of days because you're carrying hiking poles, which by the way, bring hiking poles, even if you're young and stubborn and think you can do it. Uh, my daughter laughed at me when she first started hiking with me when she was about 15, but now she would never go without hiking poles. It makes it so much easier, especially going downhill, saves your knees. So, uh, like I said, we like, I, don't, I don't bring long pants. Uh, it's something I never wear, even when it's raining. What I do, I bring a really light rain gear. I, I use uh, waterproof pants, Gore-Tex, that are breathable, gotta be breathable. Uh, the top doesn't necessarily have to be breathable. You can get some really cheap stuff called frog togs that are about 20, 30 bucks. I have an eight ounce, like 80 buck top that's waterproof and really lightweight, weighs like six ounces and if I need long pants, like on the last day of Whitney, it was in the 20s when we were up there this last year, it was very cold. Uh, you need a beanie, that's the only day I wear my beanie. I also sleep in it. And uh, a beanie will actually warm you up a lot in your sleeping bag, uh, which should be down by the way, which you have to keep dry. So there's some 
good synthetics coming out. But uh, and so for pants on the last day, I do bring thermal underwear, uh, the long long thermal underwear. You look goofy, but I wear those with my shorts on top of it. And if it gets really cold, I'll throw my rain pants on top of that. And as far as shirts, I have a couple of short sleeve poly pro shirts. I have one long sleeve poly pro shirt. And then I have a, a fleece, and I have a, a I have a vest down jacket. Uh, you can wear your down under your waterproof layer. That's all you need. Don't overdo it on clothes, but do have quality clothes. I have like an 800 fill down jacket that is incredibly warm and and uh, very 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 light and compressible. I mean, it's like this big when you when you pack it up. So uh, yeah, a lot of people bring way too many clothes. A lip balm, you better bring some lip balm. Uh, your lips will fry. So make sure you bring just, just a tube of lip balm. I think we had some Carmax last year. You could, you're, you'd be in trouble without that. A lot of people bring these big old knives and Swiss Army things. You, I'm not an ultralighter, but weight is very important to me. This is my knife. I don't bring a Swiss Army knife. It's just a very, very light plastic knife. Uh, I can use it to cut whatever I need to do. Uh, which is usually just like repairs. Uh, I make sure I bring two lighters. If you have another person coming with you, you should have two two fire sources. And the see, this is wrapped in uh, duct tape as well. And I I have a little emergency kit for things like backup aquamura, waterproof matches as well. I stuff a little few matches here and there all over my pack. In my like here's my mat bag. There's some matches in there. You should always have plastic. Don't don't forget to bring lots and lots of Ziplocs. Those are invaluable. Or you can buy these little tubes of. Uh, you should also have. You should always use duct tape. These little tubes without a middle. They're pretty compact. They come in handy for patching up your pack or a leak in your tent or whatever. And the old-fashioned fire starter. You can't really have fires on the majority of the John Muir Trail, especially when there's drought conditions like now. They probably have fire restrictions. I always bring a little candle. This is old school. Uh, if you did have to start a fire, if you have some wax with you, it's way easier to start a fire. Uh, dryer lint's another old fashioned tip. Dryer lint is extremely uh, flammable. So that's free. You can just go clean out your dryer and have a bunch of that. You should also bring, I always have some extra tent cord with me. Doesn't weigh anything. You can use it to hang food and stuff too, which is illegal by the way on the Jamia Trail. You have to have canisters. There's a few short sections of the trail where you are allowed to hang. I wouldn't recommend it unless you really, really know what you're doing. Uh, bears are very smart and they will get that food if it's hung incorrectly. Uh, I use the Tom Harrison maps. There's lots of other maps out there and lots of guides. Uh, there's a guy named uh, Eric the Black, I think his name is, has a neat little trail guide. There's a lady named Elizabeth Wink W-E-N-K that has a really awesome guide to the John Muir Trail camp spots. Has everything you need to know about it. And she knows everything about it. That's good to have. So please don't go out without a map and a compass. You shouldn't need it. We never use the compass, but the John Muir Trail is extremely easy to follow. But people do get lost. There's a couple places where you could get could get missed, could get off trail, but it's pretty hard to do. Uh, right around Devil's Post Pile is actually one of the most confusing areas. And uh, we missed a section of the trail going up towards Cathedral Lake at uh, where you cross Sunrise Creek. There was a trail going up the hill. We went a quarter mile off trail before we figured it out. The trail actually goes right along the, right, when, as soon as you cross the creek, you take a right. I bring a little altimeter. I don't like to wear a watch, but this is, this is my watch and altimeter. And altim altimeter is great because you can find where you are on the map if you know your altitude. These aren't very accurate. But accurate enough within a few hundred feet, so you can kind of figure out where you where you are. And the reason, even if you're very confident where you're navigating on the trail, there is uh, could be the need of an unplanned early exit because of injury or something else. So you need to know where the exit points are to get off the trail in case in case you have some kind of emergency. And I also recommend carrying something like this. I I have the spot. A lot of people complain about these. Works fine for me. I really carry this for the people at home, not for me. I don't ever plan on having to use this. There was a guy that just two weeks ago on the Pacific Crest Trail 
on the second day out, he hit the button because he was down to his last eight ounces of water because he couldn't read a map and find out that there was another water source nearby. And he wasn't even in Mexico, he's near Sonora. But uh, yeah, that's an expensive rescue. But uh, yeah, these it can, you can send messages to people at home so they know where you are and they can track you. But bat, this does eat up batteries if you use the tracking thing on it. So uh, a word about batteries, if you do bring a SteriPan or any other electronics, uh, get the nickel metal hydride, or the, I'm sorry, the lithium ion batteries. They're, they're really light. They're really, really expensive, but it's worth it when you're out in the wilderness. You can use those in your headlamps and uh, your uh, spot devices, things like that. And you can buy those. In, in, uh, MTR is your last place where you can actually buy those. The hyperbarrels are actually full, full of batteries, too. Uh, my daughter, of course, had her... Uh, iPhone along and we have a little cube that's a charging thing that will charge it like two times. People carry solar stuff. That's too, too many gadgets for me. I don't like that stuff. MTR will let you charge even if you don't stay there. They have a little bucket where the resupply is where you can charge up all your stuff, your cameras and all that stuff. So uh, that's, a th that's my spiel on batteries. Uh, again, take advantage of some yield free eating at the start of your trip and eat some donuts, go out to Olive Garden and have the bottomless fettuccine because you want to you want carb load before you go. And it doesn't hurt to have a little meat on your bones before you get out there. So uh, one last thing, this is something people don't like talk about, talking about. I'm going to get on my environmental soapbox again. Uh, please follow the rules. We don't want them to issue any more restrictions than they already have on the trail. And we all want to be able to enjoy this trail. Uh, so uh, camping far away, far enough away from water sources. But the thing you need to get to know is how to poop. Now, a lot of people think that they get sick on the trail from drinking bad water. And I would guess that 90% of those people got sick from eating their own poop. Uh, no, that's gross, but uh, people use bad hygiene on the trail. And uh, if you uh, get some poop on your hand, you can infect yourself with, with uh, things that could get you sick. That includes sharing food with others. You know, that uh, guy who's been on the trail, you've run into a PCT or has been out there for three weeks, and he offers you a bag of his gorp that he's been reaching into. Uh, that could be, that could have germs on it. So I'm not a neat freak. I would usually eat that anyway, but... Just giving you a warning, uh, you have to stay clean on the John Muir Trail. And you do have to pack out your toilet paper. It's not that bad. Try to use as little as you can. What I do, I wad up a little, use it, and wrap a couple sheets around what I just used and then until I'm, I'm good to go. But I only you here's what I do. I'll give you my there's look at this up on YouTube too. There's believe it or not, there's lots of ways on how to poop outside. Uh, I like to use I don't use soap. I don't condone soap in the wilderness. It's very, very bad to get, get in any kind of, of, of the water supplies out there. Uh, you know, you're hiking. Who cares if you stink a little bit? But you do got to clean your hands after you go. So I take baby wipes. And if you're weight conscious, you can just dry them out and let them just, just leave them out. They'll dry out in a couple of weeks. And then when you're out on the trail, dump a little water on, on them before you go do your duty and they're they just hydrate right up and they still have the alcohol in them. So you do your wiping with just one hand and then have your bag open and throw your crap in there and don't touch this hand. And then take that baby wipe and just go ahead and wash, wash your hands really good with that baby wipe. That should be all you need to do to stay clean out there. And then if you're still feeling a little dirty with that baby wipe, I'll take it because it's, it's already... Be careful not to reinfect your hand. You can use that to wipe yourself one last time. And put it in your Ziploc and zip it up and you're good to go. It's not that bad. So please do that. Hundred, I think, I don't know, 100 people a day pass through the John Muir Trail for several months. So if everybody was out pooping and not taking their toilet paper out, it would be bad. So anyway, I think I covered everything. Uh, if uh, There's lots and lots of information out there. Go out and practice. The trail is spectacular. Everybody should have a chance to do it. I probably won't do the whole trail again. 
uh, there's so many other areas in the Sierra that I want to see. And uh, let, I'll let somebody else have a turn. But go out and enjoy. If I left off anything, if you have any questions, uh, just go ahead and post it in the comments and I'll, and I'll check it often and I'll answer the questions and uh, have a great time and uh, go for it. Have fun. It's awesome. Thanks. Bye-bye.